Republican candidate for governor Jeff Deal is our guest. Let's go on the record. He posted a double-digit victory over Chris Doty in the GOP primary. Now his attention turns to Democrat Maura Healey. His support from Donald Trump the deal maker or is it the deal breaker in this race? The candidate is here. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. Welcome to OTR. I'm Janet Wu, along with News Center 5 political reporter Sharman Sakati. Thanks for being here. Ed is off this week. As the nation marks 21 years since 9 11, our guest this morning is Jeff Deal. He's the Republican nominee in the race for governor in Massachusetts. A former state representative, he ran unsuccessfully for the U.S. Senate in 2018. He's a resident of Whitman and a graduate of Lehigh University. He's also an Eagle Scout. Thanks for being here and thanks for joining us as we uh, start the fall season and we are officially into the general election race. Thanks, Janet. Charmin, great to see you both. Congratulations on your win. Thank you very much. Let's, let's get right to it. So your ties to former President Donald Trump worked well for you among those who took the Republican ballot. Give independent voters now who you have to bring into this race, give them a picture of how closely aligned you are to the former president. Yeah, look, I supported him in 2016. I was the only Republican to do so in that primary because I felt he was speaking to the people of not just Massachusetts, but the entire country when it came to the economy, trying to put American workers first, talking about uh, things like pulling our troops back from foreign wars that had really had no uh, national interest, uh, didn't serve our national interest. So, you know, he was speaking in a way, obviously, that was very different as politicians go, uh, but he also was talking about key issues that people focus on. I think that's what independents right now are thinking about right now, is the pocketbook issues that he won on in 2016. The economy is going to be front and center for 2022. It, and you feel very closely aligned to him right now. Yeah, I feel like, you know, his support for me in the primary shows that he sees me as having a vision for Massachusetts, much like uh, I think he delivered great economy, low unemployment during his time in office, energy independence. Those are some of the things I've been focusing on in this campaign, talking about what it takes to make sure Massachusetts economically can move forward. We lost 50,000 people last year in Massachusetts, whether it's the economy or whether it's some issues with freedom. I mean, I think people were very upset about the vaccine mandates. I think people are upset about schools not listening to parents about curriculum. A lot of people left the state. We need to turn that around and make sure that people can afford to live in Massachusetts and not leave it. Um, let's talk a little bit about what is ahead in the next couple of weeks. You've refused, you refuse to do any TV debates with your GOP opponent. So why are you willing to do TV debates now and you're even challenging Maura Healey to at least three debates and why the change in policy between the primary and the general election? It had nothing to do with TV. It just had to do with having a conservative primary. And I wanted to make sure that we would have conservative hosts, you know, some local radio hosts in Massachusetts that would actually talk about conservative issues. And so we challenged him to two debates. He only accepted one, didn't show up to the second debate. At that point, you know, it, it became a matter of just wanting to make sure that, you know, we got our message out to the Republican base in the way best way we could. But I've debated Elizabeth Warren, as you know, three times uh, televised. Uh, I've debated people like Kim Driscoll back in 2014 on the gas tax ballot question, Joe Curatone, I've asked about the gas tax ballot question. Uh, I ran four times for state representative, always debated my opponents there. It wasn't an issue about when and where to debate. He just didn't show up to the second debate. It looks like you are trying to pick safe uh, reporters or media people to make sure that you got the right conservative questions when you were running against another conservative. Yeah, Am I wrong about that? No, I just think that what we were trying to do was make sure that, again, the issues on, in the conservative part of the, part of the state you know, are different than, I think, issues that get brought up. For example, we started off talking about Donald Trump. It was pretty obvious that, uh, you know, I've been supported by Donald Trump with Republicans in the state. We didn't need to talk about that, cover that ground again. Let's talk about things that matter to uh, Republicans in that primary. We're now on to the general election. I'm looking forward to pretty robust debates with Maura Healey. All right, let's talk about COVID um, restrictions. You've certainly railed against them, um, what, some of the ones that were ordered by Governor Baker. You are vaccinated, but your running mate, Leah Allen, is not. When she was on our show, we had to interview her outside because of her unvaccinated status. When campaigning in close contact with voters, are they told about her status? Uh, you know, I think people pretty much know exactly what her stance is from the minute we announced her as our running mate, uh, we made it clear that she was fired from the hospital she worked for because she had had a baby. She was serving on a COVID ward, um, dealing with COVID patients when she was pregnant. The vaccine came out. She had her baby around the same time. She did not want to pass the vaccines on to the baby through breastfeeding, so she declined the vaccine and 
uh, ultimately was fired for that. We've made that clear from day one. But also on day one when I become governor, we're going to hire back any state worker that was, vac was fired because they didn't get vaccinated. I believe government should not force that health care choice on people and or put people's jobs at risk because of that, vac that health care choice. Do you have the responsibility or do you feel that you have the responsibility to tell voters who are having personal contact with the both of you when you're campaigning together that she is not vaccinated or do you think that's not an issue? Do you think it doesn't matter? Well, I mean, at this point, uh, I think people, again, pretty much know and if they don't know, they can certainly ask and if they feel like they want to wear a mask, they can do that. If they've been vaccinated, they're supposed to be getting protected from COVID, from those vaccinations, although we found out our former president or our current president vaccinated twice, boosted twice, caught COVID twice. I mean, it doesn't necessarily equal safety, you know, the vaccinations. I think what it does is protect you from getting seriously Ill Severe. rather that, than preventing no, you from getting COVID. No, I understand. And if you're concerned, COVID. certainly you do your health care choice that you want to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about taxes. Um, it is likely nearly $3 billion in taxes will have to be returned to the taxpayers. Have to be? They yeah. should be. Right, exactly. Well, it should be. Uh, Governor Baker wants about half of it returned in rebates and permanent tax cuts and the other half through programs which which he feels would benefit most taxpayers. What's your plan specifically? Specifically, I think that the what's codified in law from that 1986 ballot question to re force that return of that portion of the tax, excess tax revenue is good, should not be fought by Beacon Hill, even though they seem to be dragging their feet on that. Uh, but what I'd like to do actually is something that I think has been called for for a long time, get rid of the state excise tax. And I'll tell you why, there's two reasons that benefits people. Commuters right now with a high cost of gas in Massachusetts, they, um, I think they could use relief if you want to get people into more fuel efficient vehicles, let's get rid of that Korean War era tax that really doesn't make any sense anymore. I know it's collected by municipalities, state and I'm sorry, uh, cities and towns collect that. The state has enough revenue to make them whole for the getting rid of that excise tax that allows people to get into more fuel efficient vehicles. Middle to low income families can't get into an electric car or a hybrid car when they're fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. This goes a long way to helping them get into that new car. I don't have the exact numbers, but I'm pretty sure those two ideas are not made, do not make up $3 billion. So where else would you do? Would they be all permanent tax cuts of any kind? And would you put any money towards programs to benefit people? Well, I've or always, when I ran in 2009, 2010 for the state legislature and was successful, one of the things that uh, happened around that time was we increased the state sales tax from 5% to 6 and a quarter, a 25% increase. I'd like to see our sales tax go back to 5% for the long haul to allow these businesses that suffered during the pandemic. They were closed down, opened on a re on an arbitrary schedule to reopen. Uh, a lot of the employees were given enhanced unemployment to stay home. Now the state has taken that $5 billion of federal pandemic relief money and spent a lot of it, $4 billion, on pet projects instead of putting that into the state's unemployment trust fund, which we depleted to about $7 billion. That borrowing against for that $7 billion has been put on the backs of small businesses. Let's give them some advantages by cutting the sales tax. But you're not talking about putting any of that money towards like transportation, East Rail, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever, uh, MBTA, for example, example. That's a separate issue. Is that what you're saying? I, well, I'm not saying that we're not going to spend on transportation. Right, we but have not to out spend of this $3 billion. Not necessarily this, but I mean, if the state is on a path to continue to collect excess revenue, this isn't the first year we've been collect collecting excess tax revenue. We also can start focusing on those things. I think we can walk and chew gum when it comes to getting the MBTA back up to speed, looking at East West Rail and expanding South Coast Rail to make sure that you know we've got full transportation because that's going to affect housing in Massachusetts. We need to unlock regions of our state where we can create more affordable housing now that Boston is so darn expensive. You guys know in Southie, you know, those affordable triple deckers now a one floor is like a million dollars, right? So that's not affordable right. in Boston. Anyway, I'm, yeah. All right. Well, we want a couple quick answers. I'd love to keep to a going couple. on about taxes, but yeah. <laughs> and and quick we'll, answers. We have limited time and a lot to answer. You ask can tell I've been on the campaign trail. Yes. <laughs> so a couple quick answers. Just to remind voters where you stand on some of these key issues. You do support the recent Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe. Will you try to change abortion laws in Massachusetts to be more restrictive if you're elected governor? So, yeah, I agreed that the Supreme Court was right putting it back to states. In Massachusetts, what, 2020 passed the Roe Act to codify it into law to protect the state from that. And uh, I do agree with Governor Baker. There were elements of the Roe Act that were too extreme for me. I don't like the low age of parental notification. I have a 16-year-old daughter. I have a 20-year-old daughter. So will, will you try to change laws? Those are two areas I'd like to see if we can improve on. Um, th that and the fact that, you know, late-term abortion, a doctor is not required to provide medical assistance to a, a, a baby that survives a, a, a failed abortion. That's 
to me was very distressing, and, and I think Governor Baker vetoed on those elements. I'd like to see that uh, changed, but ultimately it's the legislature, as you both know, that decides that law. The governor executes law. My job is to make sure that people's health care uh, choices are protected, and Would you part of that is, and I'm just going to go back to the vaccine mandates, part of that is to make sure that people have that choice of what they want for their vaccines. But do if you think, have, for example, that abortion providers should be criminalized, which is something no, that I, has been... I don't think they should be criminalized. I, I don't agree with that. Did you not support that at one point? At least this is what some of the pro-choice groups are accusing you of. No, I, look, I am trying to... I, my wife and I believe in protecting life wherever we can. Uh, but at the same time, I think what's important is that, um, you know, people in this state have spoken through their legislators. The legislature is the one that makes that decision. My job, uh, whether I like it or not, is to make sure that we protect those rights. Um, you said that you are, you have been endorsed by Donald Trump. You support Donald Trump. Um, do you think the 2020 election was rigged? And do you still support his claim that it was? My problem with the 2020 election is, is uh, there's a few things that go on there, right? One of the things was mail-in balloting, I thought, really lent itself to some flaws overall with security. The chain of custody, when you put a mail-in ballot into a drop box, that to me is a problem. Um, I, so was the 2020 election rigged? Well, I, no, first of all, I will say this. Uh, President Biden was duly elected and certified, so the, the election is over and he won. However, uh, like I said, but I... But in the past you have suggested that the, uh, the election was rigged. I, rigged in a certain way. First of all, like I said, mail-in balloting I think has some flaws. For example, I just brought with me... Oh, you came with your two, hotel. This is, this is <laughs> mail-in ballots that have the names of two people that no longer live at this address. They haven't lived there for seven years. Somebody gave this to me. The reason I bring this in is somebody could then fill this out, send it in, and the only line of defense is a, a town clerk checking to see if a signature matches or not. And we just had a town clerk in Barnstable not even op able to open a safe for ballots. There's just concerns with election law. So, but it's Beyond really a yes that, or no question. Do you believe the 2020 election was rigged? I yes think or it was no? rigged, because, and I'll tell you why. The minute Donald Trump was elected to office, the resist movement started. Nobody, uh, the FBI basically followed through with a Hillary Clinton uh, memo trying to tie him to Russian collusion, which was proven to be false. The entire time he was in office for four years, everybody tried to stop him from winning. Mm -hmm. So that lent itself to what happened in 2020.